Rise, Court of Appeals Division 1 is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. Sorry um, for um, keeping you waiting. It was my fault. I was in the wrong courtroom based on my um, instructions from my JA. <laughs> so, yeah, I just threw her right under the bus, didn't I? Okay. Um, uh, welcome. This is uh, the time set for um, oral argument. Um, I will call the uh, case number as soon as I get it up on my screen. Um, as the parties may or may not know, um, the, uh, though this is Chulili, is my, uh, Chulili uh, versus Barrington, uh, uh, our cause number CACV 140849. Um, as parties are aware, um, each side will have 20 minutes to present their argument. Um, Appellant, you may reserve a portion of your time for um, rebuttal. If you'll tell us how much time you would like, we will um, try not to horn in on too much of your time. Um, the proceedings are being recorded, and uh, if all goes correctly, um, we should be on YouTube. Um, uh, th these will be on YouTube as well. So with that in mind, uh, you may get started. I'll just keep a couple minutes quick. Pardon? A couple minutes is all I, I'll hold back. I, okay. I typically don't have much to say on rebuttal, but uh, if I may. Yes, please, uh, get started. As you know, this is a case involving the death of a 16-year-old from an overdose of morphine. Uh, the facts indicate, I think it's pretty overwhelming, that the morphine came from the Barrington household and was given to um, Thane Perney by Jeremy Barrington. On, uh, on an afternoon, he, uh, the evidence is that, uh, that the Barrington ch uh, son knew that the drugs were morphine, given the, given the conversation he had in front of his grandmother. Uh, it's clear that he didn't tell, uh, tell Thane Perney or anybody that he was with when he handed him the pills that, this, that they were, in fact, morphine. They were prescription. Uh, it was a prescription given to his father. And in the transcript, you can see the father was heavily dependent on the morphine. They were rather large doses, 250 milligram dosages of morphine. Uh, the boy was, uh, Thane Perney was uh, morphine naive, which means that he had, not, he had no resistance or tolerance to morphine uh, in his body. Uh, the defendants called to the stand a uh, police officer, I think it was Chorus, who testified that the, uh, the distribution of the morphine by, the, uh, by Jeremy Barrington was a violation of law. Uh, and the, the issue in the case came down to a request by the plaintiff, by Chuli, for an instruction, which was that the distribution or handing out of the morphine to someone who does not have a prescription for it, who hasn't been advised of the, the uh, hazards or the potential of death or, or the side effects of it, um, is prohibited. And the, and the case, uh, and, and the uh, um, Gibson case specifically talks about the statutory scheme and the regulations uh, that prohibit the distribution of the prescriptions. And the reason it does it is to protect the safety of the person who's not on the prescription. Um, when the request, when, when I made the request for an instruction that it was a breach of duty, or so at least some, I, I rephrased it a couple of times to try and get the instruction in that there was a duty not to uh, distribute prescription drugs to someone who's not on the prescription. Uh, the judge refused the instruction, um, and what he Might said that at that be because the Gibson talks about. The question of duty being one for the court? Well, that may be, and that in the abstract is, is the case, but it's a duty for the court only if it's an issue of summary judgment or directed verdict, because the cases say that the decision, that the, in order for a jury to be able to make a decision on whether there's a, a breach, uh, the breach of the duty, they have to know what the duty was. In this case, there's absolutely no evidence, and the jury was completely um, in the dark as to what the duty was. So once it's in this, there's actually, uh, I didn't find an Arizona case, but there's an Indiana case. Ar that, let's stick with Arizona because Gibson is 
uh, <clears throat> definitely unique to Arizona. It uh, involves a concept of duty that, uh, as I read it, prescribes a legal threshold um, that one needs to pass to get to trial. You need to establish that there is a duty as a matter of the law, and then the court and the court determines that. After that, the content of the duty is not prescribed by Gibson or any other case. No, but the jury has to be told what the duty is. And, the, and, and I've cited... This is, this is a topic that's frequently... Uh, it, interpretation of Gibson is, is a, f a favorite topic of debate among Arizona lawyers and judges. But pre- and post-Gibson, telling the jury what the duty is, I think by that you mean what the content of the duty is, is forbidden under Arizona law. No, it's not, because the cases I've cited in my brief, they did, and in fact the defendants cited the case for that proposition, uh, and the name escapes me now, and I, I talked about it in the brief, where there was a very long involved description of what the duty was. Because the problem you have is, and, and again, I, the only case I found that in Indiana has the same sort of uh, negligence scheme that Arizona does, and what the court there said, and they quite clearly, the Indiana Supreme Court came out quite clearly and said it's a, it's a two-step concept. One, the issue of duty is up to the court, which is true to the extent that the court decides whether or not there was a duty. And if the court decides that there's a duty either relationship-wise or public policy-wise, and public policy was the basis of the, um, uh, of the Gibson decision, then it goes to the jury. And in order for the jury to be able to determine if there was a, a breach of the duty, in other words, what, what did the defendant do, the factual basis, apply the facts to the law, they have to, the jury has to know what the duty was. Well, is, this is a negligence case, right? That's true. So isn't the duty to act reasonably under the circumstances? Except for Gibson doesn't say, Gibson gets into a discussion of uh, not all situations uh, relationship-wise can give rise to liability. And they talk about the social host situation so that you could have a very similar set of facts. You're past that. You have a duty. You right. win on that but the, point. But the point is, the problem is the jury doesn't know what the duty is that's owed to someone like Thane Perney, who's clearly within the, the zone, uh, the old Paul's graph case, but who's within the concept of the protected class. But I always thought that the more we talked about the details of the standard of care and breach that we were in, according to Markowitz, we were into factual matters that were for the jury to determine. No, I don't, that's, that's, that's not as, I don't think that's accurate because what the, case, what the cases say is you can inform the jury of what the duty is so they can look at the facts. They take the facts of the case, what occurred, and then they say the court tells them this is what we've determined the duty to be in this case. <coughs> and the jury then makes a determination of whether or not uh, the factual circumstances of the case constitutes a breach of that duty and then goes on to... What's your, what's your best Arizona case that says the court must inform the jury of the content of the duty. The content of the duty? Well, that's what you're describing, is the content of the duty. In other words, what, what you're saying, what the duty is. I'm, I'm not sure that, that there is any viable Arizona case that requires a court to do that. Well, I think the court, ha I, I, well, I, as far as a case that, um, that, that definitively says that, I, I, can't, I didn't find one. After, after more than 100 years of tort law in the state, though, one would expect something like that if, there, if this were as obvious a proposition as you suggest. Well, that's why I'm suggesting, that's why when I, I, the, the one case that I found that, that lays it out is the Indiana Superior, Supreme Court, which has the same rule that Arizona has and says in that case that it's, it's the first issue is to get over, is for the court to decide if there's a duty. If the court says there's no duty, then the case ends at that point, which either could be summary judgment or at a directed verdict, a directed verdict point. So if, if it comes in and there's, it turns out there's no duty, then the case gets terminated and the jury never gets to decide 
whether or not the, fa the facts of the case constitutes a breach of the duty. And, in fact, the, judge, you know, the trial judge agreed that there was a duty and th 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 at page... I don't think that's in dispute. I, th I think your opposing counsel would agree that there was a duty. Then, then the problem comes up. How does the jury know if there's what the duty is and wh how do they apply the facts to, the do to, to what that duty is? You know, car accident, things like that, you know, juries are pretty savvy with because they, they live that every day and they can understand that. And you tell them if they're speeding and they can, they can make that type of determination. But you get into this type of situation, and I could, I could clearly see where someone in the jury room not being told that there's a duty not to distribute the prescriptive drugs to someone who's not on the prescription uh, would, uh, could go back there and say, well, you know, I, I don't think there's any, I don't, you know, I don't think under these circumstances there was any obligation. But they weren't even told there was a duty. They were just told you know, they would just give the the defenses. Uh, they were given the standard. They would give right. And it, negligence instruction. And it, it it just is negligence, and it doesn't it doesn't really. But that's Arizona law. I mean, are, are you well, suggesting now that that as a matter of first impression, we should reverse based upon our our adoption of an Indiana case? No, no, no. I'm just saying the Indiana case explains how they look at the same situation how they look at the same circumstances. Because if you don't tell the jury what the duty is, if they don't know uh, what, you know, it, and it's not a relationship type of case, this is not a relational, was it a relational ship type of case where you look at the action of the parties and decide what they did or didn't do. I mean, you know, a jury there could have, could have very easily come out and said, these are two 15, 16 year olds, you know, the kid shouldn't have done it, but, you know, these things happen, uh, not understanding that as a matter of law that they can't distribute, you can't take that prescription drug and give it to someone else. And, and What was the point of a trial then? Why shouldn't there just have been summary judgment for the plaintiff? Well, because they, the defendants disputed, in the overall scheme of things, disputed that uh, the, the, the Barrington kid gave... <laughs> The prescription drugs to uh, to Perny, that was that was one of their issues. They, they so you know so that was you know. But in the, for, the, for our purposes, the evidence is taken in the light most favorable uh, to the losing party, which is the recited evidence that's in there. But in their brief, they say, well, and that was their argument. It could have come from somewhere else. So the jury was well, listen. If they come out and admitted somewhere earlier that there's no dispute. That they gave him the they that, uh, they gave him the, uh, the, the the son gave him the, the morphine and that there was a duty. The only issue then the jury would have had to decide would have been the uh, uh, the damages or, or whether the morphine was a proximate cause in the in the in, in the death. But in this case, the jury was faced with one of the issues the defendant tried was whether or not the the uh, Barrington kids conduct was, you know, was a breach of the duty. I mean, they, they, that, that was left up to the jury to make a factual determination whether or not handing out this prescription medication uh, to, the, uh, to the son, to, the, uh, to Perny, was a, breach of the, uh, which was a breach of the duty. And it, it, conceptually, how a jury comes to that determination without knowing that there is a, 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 a public policy Duty, and that's what they what what Gibson says. It's a public policy uh, decision uh, duty that's created under the statutes and the regulations. Then the jury doesn't know what the measure is for the breach of the duty. That's that's the issue. It's not it's not a it's not for the jury to decide what the relationship was to see if there's a, a negligence. And, and and you know Arizona doesn't use foreseeability as part of the is part of the negligence, uh, the, the breach of the duty uh, duty concept they use. Are you familiar with the Markowitz case? I did read Supreme it, and I can't, off the top of my head, I'm sorry. I, I, well, our, our Supreme Court has warned that it disapproves of attempts to equate the concept of duty with the specific details of conduct. Um, and right, yeah, okay. I, 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 you're aware of that. Right, but that's, that's different 
than simply telling the jury what the duty is and leaving the factual determination up to the jury. If you say you have a duty not to speed uh, or, or uh, to, to maintain control of your vehicle at all times, that's the duty. Then the factual determination of whether or not there's a breach depends on what the evidence was, whether the, the, there's a breach of that, that standard. Uh, and the, the jury has to look at all the circumstances. What was the traffic? What was the speed limit? What was the speed of the vehicle? How the uh, defendant was driving and things of that nature. So it doesn't become, uh, it doesn't become uh, a mix. You, you don't mix the duty up with the factual determination because you're not telling the jury what the facts are. You're just saying there is a duty to do or not to do something. And that's, that's, I, I mean, that's consistent with Markowitz, as I, is what Markowitz says. No, Markowitz, what, what Markowitz says is that the court determines whether there is a duty, but, but it warns off telling the jury what specific things a person has to do to comply with that duty. No, this is, but what I'm saying is consistent with that. It's a, Markowitz says in negligence cases, the duty is, quote, unquote, reasonable care under the circumstances. Well, and, and but, but see, Gibson kind of undercuts that to a certain extent in some of the, in, in, and I was reading that, and it becomes. There are many who would love for Markowitz to be undercut. Well. But Gibson didn't do it. Gibson talks about the, the intermingling, I think it is, of the concept of, the, uh, of facts with, in the court, uh, facts with the uh, duty. And all I'm saying is, and I, I'm, being, I'm trying to be very distinct in setting out the fact that there's, a, there's an obligation or a do, or on the court to say what the duty is. And that duty in this case would simply be to say, paraphrasing it, an individual has a, uh, has a duty not to distribute prescription drugs to someone who's not on the prescription and, has, and hasn't been advised of the dangers of the drug. That's it. Then from that point, the evidence that goes in at the trial then determines whether or not there was a breach of that duty. The court's not saying what the, what the facts are. They're not saying they're not in any way applying the facts to the, to the duty. They're just saying this is the duty. And if you find that the defendant, if, if, the, if on the facts you find that the defendant did not meet this duty or, or, or breach the duty, then, you know, th th then you know, on lawyer's terms, then they can find, you can find or could find that there was a breach of the duty and then you have to reach the other two elements of negligence, whether it was proximate cause and an injury. Well, but part of the instruction you wanted the next to last paragraph says, if you find that Jeremy Barrington provided morphine to Thane Perney, then Jeremy Barrington is responsible for the death of Thane but Perney. But I, I cut that out. I cut that out. The later instruction, the second request that I made, I said in, in, at the time, I said, no, 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 take that out. But on page 16 of the transcript, which is 113 in the, uh, in the appendix, um, I, I just, uh, that's what the judge's response was. I, all I said at that point was uh, just a, uh, an instruction that a person has, you know, c cannot distribute, and I'm, I don't remember exactly what I said, but the gist of it was that, there's, that a person can't take a prescription medication and give it to somebody else who's not on the prescription, who hasn't been counseled by a physician uh, on, the, on the dangers and the use of the prescription. That's all I asked for. That's essentially all I asked for. Uh, on the second, uh, the second day when we came back after the judge had been able to read the, uh, uh, read the uh, Gibson case, and that's when he said, said to me uh, at that point, uh, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, um, uh, on page 16 at the top there, he, he, it was a back and forth, and I said just not to give somebody that giving the medication is a breach of duty. That was the gist of what I wanted to ask, it's just that there's this, this duty out there, period. And then it's up for the jury. 
you know, the jury could have found, and we don't know what they did, the jury could have found that maybe there wasn't any, maybe he, Perny, maybe, uh, what's his name, uh, Barrington didn't give him the prescription. We don't know. Or they could have found there was no, they could have gone back in and said there's no duty. They, they're just, we don't see any reason why there was, the, what, what uh, could have said there was the jury could have in the deliberations. The jury could nullify a duty? They, but if not knowing what it is, they wouldn't know, they wouldn't know what the measure, the, what the facts would measure up against. What was the jury instructed to do? Well, they were just instructed on, actually the defendant's position on the case is on page 62 of the appendix. It was a comparative fault instruction. That was what they, they said um, that, uh, um, you know, fault is negligence that was a cause of the injury. But the problem is you've got three, you know, you're only instructing the jury on three of the elements. Breach of duty, proximate cause, and injury under these, uh, and with the way the jury went out in this case, and they're not given any idea of what they're supposed to met, what the measure of the, the behavior was of the defendants. That's, that's the problem. That's the issue. Because it's, it, it really is kind of up in the air for the jury to go out there and really in a vacuum make a decision on what the duty was. When there was a clear, clear duty, according to Gibson, created by the statute and the regulatory scheme, uh, that you, you can't. You didn't ask for a negligence per se instruction. I didn't, no, it was, no, I didn't ask for per se. Uh, you know, Gibson, I think, was more, was, well, I, I thought Gibson was accurately covered the, uh, uh, covered the, the issues, applied more specifically, I guess, was what I'd say to the issues in the case. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. May it please the court, Brad Jardine is my name. I represent the defendants Barrington's both here at oral argument as well as at the time of trial. Um, I think the, the court has put its finger upon the issues here very simply. Uh, Rajis were given. They were appropriate. The trial judge agreed. Uh, there was no misleading the jury. There was clearly no confusion. I'm happy to go through the facts if you wish to do that. There are multiple instances in the, in the record where my uh, friend and colleague, Mr. Gordon, has suggested what those facts uh, were. But there were, I, th I think, the primary reason why the judge, or excuse me, the jury decided the reason, the court, excuse me, the decision it did, is because the uniform medical testimony that was offered there, both from the county medical examiner, as well as Mr. Gordon's expert, as well as my expert was, that if, even assuming the truth of the information that was provided and argued by the, by the plaintiff, if it were true that my client uh, Mr. Jeremy Barrington handed three to four pills, and they were morphine, to the plaintiff, excuse me, to the deceased, that the deceased medically would have been dead or comatose on the way to death within two to four hours. And what we know from the facts is that within two to four to six to eight to ten hours, he was um, skateboarding with friends at a park. His mother came, picked him up late that night. He had dinner with her at 11 o'clock between seven and 10 hours after the pills were provided to uh, the deceased, he was up and around and by all accounts uh, was fine. And medically that simply just didn't measure up to what was being alleged as to the cause of his death. Um, so that was the circumstance in which we found ourselves really very simply. The issue before the court was whether it was, he was, um, excuse me, whether the jury was properly instructed. Uh, those of us with a few gray hairs realize and remember the Markowitz decision. Uh, my partner was the one who was defending <laughs> that case. Now senior judge Tilburg was, uh, was the uh, judge, excuse me, was the lawyer for the defense on the Markowitz case. I was a brand newbie lawyer at the time that decision came down, which was a monumental decision uh, by Judge Justice Feldman, then Justice Feldman. Uh, because he basically rewrote the whole concept of tort duty in the state of Arizona. And we have been ever since very cognizant of the fact that the question of duty is a question of law for the court. We don't provide that issue to juries to decide. 
That's a, that is a judge decision. We provide information to the jury so that they can decide the evidentiary fact-based issues of breach, causation, and so forth. And that is precisely what happened here, precisely consistent with the Rajis. And I will tell you that there is well-reasoned <laughs> um, uh, explanation as to why those of us who've been doing this for a while don't like to depart from the Rajis because we read the appellate decisions just like everybody else does. And so uh, this judge was accurate in terms of what he uh, instructed the jury. His denial of the motion for new trial was very express, saying that he believed that the jury was properly uh, advised and instructed and they made their decision accordingly. I'm happy to spend more time with you, but I don't need to spend any more time than that if you, unless you have some questions. Well, one could argue that Markowitz sets us up for a grossly inefficient and unpredictable uh, system of civil justice. Um, are you aware of any cases, uh, same question I asked your colleague, are you aware of any cases in which courts, trial courts, have been required to instruct the jury on the content of duty post Markowitz. I am not. Um, I, I did notice in the in the brief that was supplied by my colleague, uh, Mr. Gordon, and I think he cited to a, um, a 1946 case, as I remember, where he there was some instruction about what the duty was in that particular decision, but. That's pre-Markowitz by a lot of years. I, I should say, I mean, all credit to Justice Feldman, but I, my recollection is that Prosser warned some time ago against discussions of the specifics of what a duty entailed. No, que no question to about juries. it. Yeah, with all respect, Your Honors, we have, uh, those of us who do this kind of work have, have wrestled with that issue and with the, um, the vagueness of the Rajis. But like it or not, those instructions seem to have weathered the test of time reasonably well. Since Raji second? Yes, there's a Raji fifth now, actually. Well, no, I know there have been subsequent Rajis, <coughs> but back, back in the days of, Raj, of the early Rajis, the Supreme Court used to approve them. I'm wondering if the negligence instruction has been reworded in any way no. in Raji five. No, not in any substantive meaningful way at all. It has remained the same. And I have, I have nothing further to offer. Thank you. Very good. Maybe just, just, I don't think I can. No? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay. okay, thank you. We will take the matter under advisement and issue a ruling in due course. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.